For 40 years, we have been lied to about women and men, about domestic violence, about sexual assault, about privilege, about rights, even about the very idea of equality. Erin Pitsy, who founded the world's first internationally recognized battered women's shelter, has known all along that something's wrong because she witnessed the change herself back in the early 1970s. Today, she talks to many younger men and women who have been hurt by hateful and dishonest gender ideology, and she has a question for them. When did you wake up? And how long have you been awake? And of course, what should we do about it now? Welcome to When Did You Wake Up with Erin Pitsy and her co-host, Dean Esme. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Saturday, December 20th, 2014 edition of When Did You Wake Up with Aaron Pitsy. I, as usual, am Aaron's co-host, Dean Esme, sipping this time on coffee instead of tea. Are you with us today, Aaron? Yes, I am sipping tea, I might remind you. It's much better for you. It probably is, and I'll probably switch to it when I finish this cup of coffee. Um, As usual, we'll do a slight update on the White Ribbon situation, just to alert people again to aaronswhiteribbon.org. Please be sure to visit whiteribbon.org if you want to learn the truth about what really goes on with domestic violence and not what uh, ideological feminist organizations, uh, some of which use a similar name, spread out there. We've even got a couple of papers up there by Aaron now called A Comparative Study of Battered Women and Violence-Prone Women and Marinated in Violence, Therapeutic Intervention for Victims of Domestic Violence. They're very good. Aaron, what you were telling me, you had trouble getting to it, but uh, I think that's just trouble on your computer because the... Yes, I'll check it. It's fine for me today. Yeah, yeah, I'll check it because it's, uh, it's perilous in a sense because particularly the uh, the one the the one to, the battered women violence pro, prone women i had dreadful trouble getting that published and it's only recently been published academically and it's caused a furore because there is no evidence coming out of any of the shelters about anything that goes on with the women in there well if anything and, and anybody's have anybody is having trouble getting to whiteribbon.org let us know but right now the site looks good to me I'm not surprised it causes a furor because it's like feminist-dominated, the loose model-dominated stuff don't want to do anything to help women who themselves are prone to violence. That seems to be the case to me anyway. Is that your experience, Well, well, you you have to get used to the idea that the, the whole point of the feminist argument about patriarchy was a financial one. And the reason that they, the, there, there are no violent women, according to, to the feminist movement, because any, any violence perpetrated by a woman is always in self-defense. Because the mantra is, all women are innocent victims of men's violence, when we know perfectly well that women are equally capable of being violent, and certainly I am, as men. It's, it's been a fraudulent lie for years, and we're going to bust it. Um, we're going to have to bust it because people don't want to hear it, whether it's due to ideological feminism or old-fashioned conservative chivalry. People don't want to hear it. And those people are actually arguably hurting those violent those women with problems with violence because they're not helping them overcome and transcend their own violent impulses. Yeah, and they don't, and they don't help men who are violent because basically they, their attitude to men who are violent is that they need to be punished, partly because, first and foremost because they have a Y chromosome. And they That's have to right. apologize for being on this earth. That's no way to start a treatment program. To say nothing of the men who aren't violent at all and just get mm-hmm. beaten on because they won't hit back. Anyhow, that's none of this is news to regular listeners of our show, but if you're not a regular listener, I hope you do check out whiteribbon.org. In the meantime, let's get on to the main focus of our show today, 
We have with us today Mr. Paul Elam, who a few of you may have heard of. Are you there, Mr. Elam? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, good morning uh, or slightly good afternoon, everybody. I'm here with my tea as well. Good. <laughs> well, I hope it's PG Tips. We only allow PG Tips on this show. Well, I'm afraid I'm 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 with Earl Grey, but uh, that's no. Uh, what can that's I posh tea. That's posh tea. That's right, you snob. You <laughs> snob. I don't think we'll have him on here. We have to talk about something else. As long as he has it with a slice of lemon, he's all right. Well, we'll we'll hope he's doing that very same thing. So, Paul, this is going to be a little unusual of a show. Not too unusual. We usually start by asking a guest who we've never interviewed before. When did you wake up? And how long have you been awake? And we already sort of know Paul's answer, sort of. I don't. Um, uh, well, we've interviewed him before, as you may remember, and he talked about his time, and he's written about his time as a substance abuse counselor, oh, and yes. the way he saw men treated very differently from women, and so on. And so what I'm hoping to do when we ask Paul his question is to ask him if there was anything earlier than those days that made him start questioning anything he was being told about relationships between men and women. So, Paul, why don't you tell us something about your history that you haven't told us about before? Wow. Um, okay. You, <laughs> you, know, you know, Paul, I always think that a very good thing to do is to go right back and see if you can, just off the top of your head, remember the first time, whatever age you were, when things didn't seem quite right. I can tell you exactly mm -hmm. when that was. Um, uh, to, to give a little background, I was grew up in a military family. My father was a uh, career army, fought in Korea, was an advisor in Vietnam, um, had all the scars to prove it. Um, very traumatized man, uh, very uh, rigid authoritarian type uh, from that generation. Yes. Um, and my mother, a very hardworking housewife and mother that uh, took care of her children, and yet there was something wrong with the picture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was really strange because it took me a long time to figure out that it wasn't my father that was in charge. Uh, nice. the, the, he was, um, he was, I mean, and he was a guy that you, you wouldn't cross him, um, uh, and physically abusive, violent, um, uh, absolutely rigid in terms of being in, uh, in control of his children and appeared very much when he was home anyway, because, you know, the military takes you a lot, but appeared very much to be in charge all mm -hmm. the time. And, um. I think I figured out about 13 that he wasn't, and it was really interesting. It was um, an incident. <laughs> this is almost embarrassing, and, and it's very personal, but uh, uh, I promised to talk about personal stuff this time. Uh, an incident when I was 13 with not wanting to take some medicine. Mm -hmm. And... I was just refused to take some medicine for, for diarrhea. And okay. my mother had decided that I was going to take it. Mm. And it ended up in a scene with both of my older brothers sitting on me on the floor while my mother cracked me with these wooden spoons in the middle of the kitchen, screaming at me, and I wasn't going to take it. And it was like a scene. I just had a very bizarre scene that the, I just – had decided to rebel. It's horrific, and, wasn't it? Absolutely horrific. Uh, yeah, it was. And it was even more horrific in retrospect than it was at the time. But I felt like for some reason I was engaged in the battle of my life. Mm. And mm. Uh, uh, the, the neighbors even came knocking on the door. And I remember my mother getting off of me my brother's still holding me down and running to the back door and opening the door and saying, no, everything's okay. Then boom, shutting the door. And I was a rebel from that moment on. Uh, I knew something was wrong in that situation. And my family thought that was normal. 
so that's why it took you probably so long to suddenly recognize because in your own way you were trying to put down a boundary yes i was you, yeah you had the right to say no uh, and uh, it, it was absolutely alien to her yeah the, the the idea that anybody would ever any of her children would ever say no about anything and she wasn't going to have it and uh, I think that set up a, a, a battle between my brothers and myself, a lot of family angst, because I, for whatever reason, was elected to be the one in my family that was going to say no to the control. Well, did you ever consider that you might be making a step towards health, which they weren't? In retrospect, I know that that is exactly what I was doing. Um, I did not know it at the time. As a matter of fact, until I was in my late 20s, I was convinced that I was just a rebellious bad kid. What happened to her relationship with you after that incident? Did it change? Yes. Um, we remained, I mean, uh, fairly congenial, but never close after that. Was she close to anyone? Really? I don't. I think she was close to my father. Yes. And I, th I think that I had two parents that, that really did love each other, but that were just a, a bit crazy each in their own way. Did he but, bully her? No. Or only the children? Uh, yes, he bullied us, not her. Nobody and bullied her. <laughs> right. So the power in the family obviously lay within her hands. Yes, it did. And that was the, I think that was the great illusion that I, I grew up with seeing this strong. I mean, my father was a, a, a Golden Gloves boxer. He was a very, very tough individual. Um, and I grew up seeing him believing that that's where the power resided in my family. And even after this incident where I started rebelling and I rebelled the rest of my life, I, I'm still that that 13 year old kid on the floor that won't take the medicine. Um, but even it took me a couple of years, at least after that, to start figuring out that he didn't have any control at all. Did she use that thing that women so often do, which she says she tells the father to discipline the children and he does that? Oh, yes. Is it, and, and, and she had it down to such a fine art. She would only have to whisper, uh, Paul did this or one of my other brothers did that. And the, the punishment machine was on. You see, the tragedy about all this is, and I've had a father when, in his 70s crying because when, while his wife was allowed, uh, 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 sorry, alive, he, she used to wait till he came home and did the thing. Now, you know, you've got to beat your sons. And he did. He, he beat all four of them. And he said, I had, he'd never been mothered. He'd never been in a family. He was adopted. And, and he just said, I know that, that I was too frightened for her to say no. And that's such a tragedy. Do you think your father ever thought for himself that maybe she was too hard on you or, or hard on, on you or not? Um, I don't know if he ever challenged anything she wanted ever. It's it. it, it, was, it was, so he was such a um, a walled off uh, individual, uh, uh, very very private. So it, there is still many ways I could never gauge what might have been going on in my father's mind. But it is my belief, as near as I can put it together in my head, uh, that his life was about serving her. Yes. And nothing else. And, and, that, in, and, and in return, wasn't. Paul, in mm -hmm. return, how would you describe the, her relationship to him? I mean, I know you said that, that they loved each other. Was she able to put his needs before hers? Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, um, uh, uh, my mother actually did a lot of sacrificing for him. He developed, uh, and we believe it was from the Agent Orange in Vietnam, he developed early onset Alzheimer's. Mm. Um, and for a, a long, slow, terrible death of him vanishing uh, in, inside his own head mm -hmm. and becoming a shell of a person. And she refused to have him in, put into a facility. She was a registered nurse. 
and she took care of him around the clock and I believe uh, and worked so hard at it that I believe it put her in an early grave. Um, yeah. So there was love there, mm. but there was this quiet sense of control mm. that, that my father was like the perfect white knight. Mm. Um, and uh, that reminds me of a second incident um, when I was 17 and uh, nearly uh, close to leaving home at that point, although I didn't quite know it, that I was going to, uh, uh, in, in less than a year, I'd be in the service myself. But we were at a family gathering, and I had a crush on a girl in high school, and I had her picture in my shirt pocket. And I would take it out <laughs> every 20 minutes or so and just take a peek at it. Um, and my mother saw me do that, and she grabbed the picture without asking, and I instinctively grabbed it back. And my father just belted me, I mean, just with a fist right across the side of my head in front of maybe 15 or 20 people. God. And... Uh, because because I had any kind of boundary with my mother at all, that mm. that and <laughs> it was uh, fascinating because at this point I had begun to become very introspective and think about things in a more philosophical way. Because when the the family dysfunction runs that way, some people's reaction, my brother's reaction, was to just model the family dysfunction and play the roles of protector for my mom and. And, and all this other stuff. And, of course, I rebelled, um, I, as I guess most people who know me would have figured that would be my role. But it, instead of reacting in the expected way, I, I, he knocked me back very hard up against a wall. And I came off the wall and had blood running down from the corner of my eye. And I said, do you feel like a man now? Yeah, and? And he never touched me again after wow. that. You got he, through to him. At some level, he really heard you, didn't he? Oh, he did. And I could see the shame on his face. Mm. Uh, and I could see the embarrassment for him in every one of my extended family. Mm. Uh, but there was a, a quiet tension in my home from that point on that I finally escaped into the service with myself. The only problem with this is I do wonder when you have a mother who is a total control freak, and that's actually true of an enormous amount of women, behind the front door, that is where they rule, and it's, it's a rule that is never, ever questioned. This is in women who are violent themselves. They don't have to be physically violent, but they control absolutely everything. I think, I suppose the question I would say is that one of the problems with that is probably the same the other way around for women who have violent fathers, is that the men then tend to follow the pattern and the next relationship with a woman they have is usually a woman, as you know, that's very like the mother. And they find themselves in an extended version of a childhood until one day they wake up. Now, you woke up early. How did that affect your relationships with girls? Um... I, I, I don't know if I was even conscious of an effect of it. I knew, knew that uh, I, I followed in many ways in my father's footsteps in my early life in my 20s that um, it was sort of like if I, if I was attracted to a girl, if I thought she was beautiful or if I liked her, then I would just you know try to figure out what I needed to do to please her. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's all I would figure out. I wouldn't measure her character. I wouldn't weigh out whether or not that she had good moral values or that she was trustworthy is if I was attracted to her, it was my job to please her and to be and do anything to please her. Um, yeah, that's uh, a submissive role, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, and I, I didn't see it as such at the time because I had developed a lot of my father's bravado. Mm. And, and so I was another, I was a great big tough guy. Um, nobody would mess with me. And so how could I be weak? Right. Mm. Inside, uh, the, my instant reaction to women was to please and serve mm. without 
question without thinking about my own values, my own identity, or how I was being treated. And I did that for a number of years uh, until a bad marriage finally where I, I think I probably repeated everything that went on in my family. Yeah. Uh, until and, and when that went south and, and, and blew up on me, I finally started waking up to everything. Is and there that, a moment that you can pinpoint when you suddenly thought, oh no, I've been here before. This isn't all right. Uh, I, it was in September of 93 mm -hmm. uh, when Warren's book came out. Oh, wow. And uh, I had, at that point, I had worked in the substance abuse industry. I'd gone into, into to, I went to school, uh, I uh, had actually moved up very rapidly. I was a clinical director of three programs um, uh, simultaneously, had private contract work, and uh, was doing television appearances here in Houston mm. uh, about substance abuse in, in family members and, and things like that. Had quite a career going, but I noticed that there were there was always this, there's something wrong. And I couldn't, I mean, it was wrong in my life. It was wrong in my relationship life. It was wrong in the treatment field. It was wrong everywhere. And I just had no way to articulate it. I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And I got Warren's book. Uh, I, and I had talked to a friend who was a therapist. I, I wasn't in therapy at the time, but I had talked to a friend and she recommended uh, she had not even read the book, but she said, this title sounds interesting. Why don't you look at that? So I, I did, and I read read the thing in, I think, two and a half days. Uh, I don't think I slept but four or five hours in the whole time. And I, every bit, it, it was like I was instantly enraged. But it was a, an anger that was like the light coming on. Mm -hmm. That... Oh, 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 my God, of course. Yeah. And that was where it, the light came on for, for me personally and in a lot of different levels. Um, uh, professionally, and then everything changed. And, and uh, if I thought I was a rebel before that, and I was, mm. I, the only reason I didn't get fired from a lot of jobs is that I became very excellent at getting referrals, which meant money for my employers and the people I contracted with. Um, I didn't get along with my coworkers, but nobody could get me fired because I was worth too much money. But also, <laughs> how, how more valuable you were to the people that you were helping. Yeah? Uh, oh, after I woke up, it, yeah. I, I, that was when I became a counselor. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I, I, I was, a, 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 I think, a zombie until mm -hmm. that moment. And after that, I really started becoming a counselor. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah. wait a minute, are you saying you were working as a counselor, but you don't feel you were effective as one? Is that, is that what you mean? Well, what I think <laughs> was uh, that I was absolutely working as a counselor. And I think that, that you know, just like uh, with all counseling, most most of it is very marginal at best, particularly in the substance abuse area. Recidivism rates are high. Um, and, you, you know, you, there is no talking cure. You don't you counseling is uh, not a field if you want to thrive on seeing people's lives change regularly. I mean, you can have some impact on some of them, and a very few you can have a large impact. And I don't know if I, if I became any more effective or not, but I know that I became absolutely more humanized and that I saw men and women both very much differently um, and began to figure out the, the, the power dynamics and the problems because when you, even when you're counseling addicts and alcoholics, it all comes back to relationships anyway. It comes back to their families. It, come, it goes back to their marriages. Um, and I began to see all that with a crystal clarity. And I believe that at that point that I was able to instigate a lot more insight in people. I will say that. I don't know yeah. about fixing people's lives, but I was able to talk to them in a way after that where they were going, wow, I get that. And, and aha for themselves. 
That's brilliant. Yeah. The question I wanted to ask you, did you find that when that second time when you actually woke up after you'd read Warren's book, I've often found it leaves people feeling very naked and, and insecure because suddenly the people around them still are fast asleep. And you don't quite know whether you should be saying something to them. And if you do, if it won't make them angry with you. Well, that has <laughs> for me, Aaron, that was never an issue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a problem offending or bothering people. I obviously still don't. If anything, I became more secure by far and I was more certain when I was pissing people off that I was doing it for the right reasons because I began talking in a field that, that really didn't want to talk about men except as problems. Yes. And one where I had participated in that, I became an unapologetic, uh, uh, a bordering on dogmatic advocate for men and, and and an advocate for holding women accountable. I had fits in, uh, I mean, within two weeks of reading that book, I was in one of the places that I contracted with, I noticed that we had a policy that every client that came into there was assessed on whether or not they were a victim. Every female client was assessed on whether or not that they had been abused. Mm. And every male who was in relationship or marriage was evaluated on whether or not that they were an abuser. It's shocking, isn't it? it yes, I, mean, I didn't notice until the light was on. I didn't. That ex notice. Yeah, extraordinary. Yeah. And then, and and so we had a staff meeting, and this is like two weeks after I read Warren's book, and I said, I need to ask something. Why are we doing this this way? This is sexual discrimination. We know that women can be violent. And we don't even ask. We're mental health professionals. We're not even asking men if they're being abused. We're not even asking women if they're abusing their husbands or their children. And we're not even asking alcoholic, drug-addicted women if they're abusing their children or their husbands. And the reaction that I got from my peers was absolute outrage. Yeah, that's, that's, I imagine that. And And of course then... In a, I guess in a true sense, I had my battle, my family battle set up all over again. Yeah. I wasn't going to be controlled anymore by being brainwashed. And I had a great big dysfunctional family called the world <laughs> that, that really, really wanted me, uh, wanted to knock me upside the head for saying, no, that picture of that girl is mine. And, See the, but you know, the thing about, about this, that, that, Listening to you, I suddenly think, was thinking to myself, nobody has any real interest in telling the truth about women because every, everybody's invested financially in actually proving that all women are innocent victims of men's violence. So this is probably why it isn't just women or radical feminists, but it's men as well who are guarding their pockets. Because oh, the, yes. Yeah. I, I, was, I was so guilty of that uh, yeah. during those days that uh, at, at, at one place and I, I directed one hospital program and I was the one that brought up, brought in a women's track and began women this and women that. I was just being, I didn't know it at the time, but I was being my father all over again. And I was obsessed with, we, we must, you know, figure out why that recidivism, recidivism rate is higher in women than, uh, than it is in men, and that, and that we have a much smaller... Po I didn't see the fact that there were much fewer women in treatment as an indication that men were more affected by addiction. Mm. I saw it as proof that we didn't reach enough women with problems. Mm. Well, I mean, how could the woman think anything could be a problem? This is my problem in the refuge. They'd come in with social workers introducing them as victims. And I had the unwelcome news of being able to say to them, no, you're not a victim. You're equally responsible. And the relief it would give to a woman who in her heart of hearts knew the truth. And that's the tragedy of all this, you know. Yes, it is. And I bet, Aaron, we both share that experience of 
being in an environment where you're actually watching people who think they're helping but mm. are are really reinforcing the idea that the woman must assume the idea of, of victim or, or and the identity of victim and they think that's helping and they, it's but, but, to go against it well i think the thing too is that i used to stand on platforms in america saying to the whole room, I can't be the only woman who is responsible for my own violence with the most dreadful silence. Because, again, I can't understand where the idea that is so attractive to women to allow themselves to be considered useless, weak, indeterminate, and having to be defined through their relationship with a man. It's everything the feminists said that they didn't want to do to women, and yet they've turned on women, and they have actually in a sense, damaged women incredibly badly with this whole victim victim mentality. Absolutely. Paul, I seem to recall you telling a story. Um, I hate to interrupt, but didn't you tell me, or didn't you mention once that you were working on one of these women's programs at a hospital or a therapy program or something, thinking really hard about how you were going to help women? And you had a homeless guy come up to your car or something, and you waved him off as a stupid bum? I waved him off as an annoyance. I was driving to work, and I was doing my morning routine of coffee and how am I going to help women today in my head. And a guy approached my car that he either wanted some money. I mean, who, who knows why he wanted money? He could have wanted it for booze. He could have just simply been hungry. Um, he didn't look good. He was obviously homeless. And I was like outraged. Uh, I was, uh, get, get out of here. Uh, he had interfered in my thoughts about how I was going to go be a savior that day. And I couldn't even see him. I couldn't see a human being there. How long was it before you realized and remembered that moment? It was, that happened about six months before I read Warren's book. Shocking, isn't it? It's it's almost like I can't see. Did you? Yes, I did. I sat down in my living room and I thought back, I mean, because all these lights after I read the book were just like going on in my head about my whole life, about uh, my mother and father's relationship, the way I had related to women, uh, about the the work I was doing, everything. It was like all the lights were coming on at once. And I had that moment and I sat there and I wept in shame. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's the difficulty of all this is um, there's a philosopher, he's a very flawed philosopher, uh, called Gurdjieff, and he writes about the fact that most people are asleep and that it's like we're all driving our own bus with our eyes shut. But the thing he makes, the point he makes, and this is so right, that when you wake up, it is so enormously painful, which is what you're describing, it's so painful that for many people, they simply shut their eyes and go on driving the bus because they can't bear to face what it actually means. And I think that when you when you talked about the effect of my family on me earlier, Aaron, I think mm-hmm. that and, and, and how that was really what what appeared to be um, a great trauma and, and sickness was actually a path to health. I think that is exactly what was happened because my family experience set me up to not be able to unsee things. I know. I know. You know, it's often, I've often said to the women in the refuge, you've had PhDs in suffering. You don't need to go to university. Just go and practice what you know. And that's in a sense, it can be, you, can, you can say that to people who have woken up. Yeah. Because one of the, 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 the saddest parts of it all is that if one can actually get to where you can separate yourself as, as an adult to look at what formed who your mother was and formed who your father was. My mother was horribly abused by her stepmother. My father was appallingly abused. There were 17 children in the family. He was the 17th and the most battered. So you get that understanding. Once you understand and look at generational violence, it all makes sense. Yes, it does. It, and it is, uh, I don't know, I think our biggest challenge is to figure out why 
some people can wake up and why others can't. Uh, if there's a you, magic bullet about that, because I know there's some people that will never wake up. It doesn't matter what you do. They don't want to is the answer. Or maybe, for instance, I wouldn't try and wake up a, a, a narcissistic exhibitionist. I have, I have had <laughs> them in my refuge. But my God, when you touch that rage by trying to make them wake up, you better be wearing asbestos uniform because Paul it's really Do dangerous. Paul and Dr. T call them CBs. Where do you get that, Paul? Well, from cluster B uh, in the, the you know, diagnostic criteria, cluster B personality disorders, borderlines, narcissists. Um, I mean, there's, there's such vague and fuzzy boundaries. There is diagnostic criteria that differentiates them, but basically personality disorders. Um, and, and I'm not talking about, because a, a lot of us can have traits that resemble yeah. that stuff, but when people are on the extreme end of the spectrum of borderline or narcissist, I, and I know that there's people that, uh, are deeply offended by this, uh, but I'm sorry, the, the truth hurts. There is no treatment. And then Just of course, particularly when you know what went into making that person, uh, eventually, particularly if they're very young and in, a, in the cases where you have both parents sexually abusing their children and the damage that they, they have done by the time the child, well, from, from the very beginning, and those children have very little chance. Uh, they, I do think that what I could do was to offer them what I used to call other strategies for survival because I would actually say to them, look at this for your own self-preservation if you do that. And that would make a change, but it would take many years. I had programs, you see, where women could live for up to six or seven years because you have to actually retrain the brain. And that is the great hope that we do have, that the brain is plastic. You can change if you want to, but it, you'd be, a I, like you, I have had to have times when I've simply said, I can't do any more than this for you. And I know that underneath all this, you don't want to make any of the changes that are necessary. And therefore, you are condemned to a lonely life. Because as you get older, that's what will happen. It's a horrible yeah. prognosis. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I do feel compassion, in a sense, for these people that are, are like this on the extreme end. And on the other hand, I also, in, and, and as I know, I, I know you have, Aaron, I've worked with the family members of these people enough to know the, the incredible amounts of suffering they inflict yeah. on innocent people. And I do get to a level where it's like, okay, my advocacy here is for the victim, not it has for the to be. Yeah. I mean, I had a mother. It was interesting because I fell down with roller skating. And when I s tried to sit up, I could see the bone on my left hand in my wrist where it was broken, poking up through the skin. So I was the little boy that I was skating with. I sent him back to tell my mother. And he came running back with a message from her. There's nothing wrong with your legs. You can walk. Now, that's a true narcissist. And, and I don't think I, ne well, I never I, managed to get through to her ever. Because no. that's that's that coldness. That's that blocking off. And a very important message I was given. Uh, it was me running around rescuing people. And then somebody saying to me, Aaron, have you ever considered that the child that you're trying to reach and that damaged person may be dead? And you're carrying a corpse on your back. And to that point, I never had. I would go to the ends of the earth to try and resuscitate. But there are times when you have to stand back and say, like you said, there's nothing we can do. And to, to try to work with those that we can. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And it, it's my before I die in 75, you begin to think about these things quite seriously. I do want us to be able to completely reverse the thinking right across all the family agencies that are working and the thinking that it is not patriarchy. That has been a fraudulent concept to raise money. It has always been a family matter, a generational family issue. And if we can do that, we can give everybody the hope that changes can be made. But yes. as it is at the, at the moment, as we've condemned all men, what the radical feminists have, there is no hope. 
Well, and the, the, the sad thing for me is as I look at the mental health field, mm. and I, you know, there was the old joke in the hospital that the, the, in psych hospitals that what's the difference between the patients and the staff at, in a mental hospital? Well, eventually the patients get better and go home. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely true. Yeah. And the, the problem is, is that we have to treat the industry. Mm. And it's not. The first job is that is treating the industry, not the patient, because the industry is sick. Yeah, and that's a big challenge. Well, see, my first job is to say, and I have been saying this since seventy one. Why is it that we keep taking children away? Because every time you take a child away from a woman, she replaces the child. So you just double and treble and quadruple the program. <clears throat> Why don't you do what I did, which is to take the woman in? with the children, mother the woman so she can mother her children and have very good men working with her so she can learn how to establish a safe, loving relationship with men. But uh, that was much too radical approach. Yes, and that was one of the most horrific approaches. Again, it was another point of battle when, when I worked in the treatment field is that when, we, when I, Started and, and other people starting up setting women's tracks. We began a process of walling off men from women mm. in, in the treatment environment when we should have been working to integrate them. Yes. And uh, we did the exact office. We, uh, opposite. We, uh, we uh, put women off in one area, uh, usually a little nicer area, uh, treated them as a special population, and helped blame the men who were also our clients for the problems in that, in that group of women. It, and uh, I've been mean, looking back and waking up to what you're doing. Mm. Uh, uh, you, the, the reaction can be, uh, I think if you have a conscious, uh, that it, the reaction, one of my first reactions was shame. Like, yes. how could you ever have ever thought that this was going to help anybody? But also you see an awful lot of men, because shame is one of the uh, weapons that mothers use against their children. It's almost written into the contract of being a mother that, uh, you know, that, and that boys particularly grow up and so much more now than when I was young, because when I was young, boys were still respected. Uh, and the idea of being a boy was normal. Now, the whole thing about shaming boys and men is a huge and it's had a horrible profound effect on young boys and I don't see a way out of this because how do you stop it when it's used as not even thought about that you make a boy ashamed because he's a boy I think Aaron that the only way that we stop it is the same way that I stopped my father from beating me mm. and that was with shame um I I made him feel small mm. being a bully. Mm. And these people are bullies. They they are absolute bullies. And I think one of the reasons that we've begun to finally start changing some of the narrative is because we figured out, just like we all know growing up and as we become adults, that ultimately bullies are cowards that they're afraid of, of facing the truth and that many of them, if there's any humanity left in them at all, will absolutely change when the environment insists on it. Yes, and I think that's have, right. We have begun to change the dialogue to that effect that we're seeing feminists change their language. We're seeing them on the defensive and we're seeing the more extreme of them getting even more shrill and more crazy in their rhetoric. Um, and I think that, much like the, 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 the blowing up of the dysfunction in my family growing up, we're seeing that in, on a social level that finally the kid that's in the corner of the room pointing at the elephant that everybody else is denying is starting to get some of the attention. It's a little uh, counterintuitive by shame as a problem, and you decide to use shame as your weapon to fight it. Some, some might call you a hypocrite for that. Well, they might, but let me put it this way. Uh, there is a healthy sense of shame. There, 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 I, I believe that my shame over how I treated 
the, 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 the homeless man was healthy for me. I believe that my shame over mistakes I've made in the treatment field was healthy for me. What we did in chemical dependency treatment over and over again, I mean, we can call it all the sophistication and, and, and insight that we can put all kinds of euphemisms on it, but our job was to take people who were destroying their lives with drugs and alcohol and force them to hold a mirror in front of themselves and look at what it was. And it wasn't just having them look at their childhoods and the sense of where they were abused. We did that too, and that was important work. But they also had to face the destruction and damage that they were causing to mm -hmm. people. And that does bring on a sense of shame. Uh, when you're when you make mistakes that hurt people and you have what I would call a normal human conscience, guilt, shame, whatever you want to call it, is a healthy part of moving away from that behavior. It's our barat, it's our rudder that steers. Well, I, yeah, that that I would say is extremely healthy. The unhealthy shame is it's, it's the interesting part of a friend of mine called Andy put, taught me this. What would happen is that the father attitude towards the mother whatever the mother did if she came storming into the a bedroom and smashed something the child was doing the father's reaction would be to look at the child and say what did you do to upset your mother now that's that awful double bind because it makes the child feel ashamed and confused because is the father saying it's all right to have your stuff smashed my father always that was his answer to everything what did you do to upset pat you mustn't upset your mother and that's a very difficult thing for a child to deal with, partly because the child knows when the mother's doing something. For instance, she's drinking and she's slurring around the place and the father's condoning it. Absolutely. And I think one of the ways I know that John Bradshaw put it in a way was that there was a difference, a profound difference between shame and guilt. That, that mm -hmm. guilt is I made a mistake and shame is I am a mistake. And yeah, that's right. Uh, and teaching people the difference. So perhaps I'm, I'm really just using the wrong language here, but I think that the way that, that people change is when they begin to actually experience the appropriate feelings about their own behavior. Yeah, I think and, that's right. And yeah. that, that when we get to that, we can have people change. And that there was, even though I... You know, I certainly had a, a ambitions of a crusade to change the entire treatment field in uh, three weeks. <laughs> that, that did not work out very well. I was able to reach other clinicians that I knew and, and get them privately and say, I really want you to listen to this. Mm. And I did have an impact on them. I was going to ask you also something that I've asked other people, other men in the field that you've worked in. I have always said that in the refuge, I noticed how incredibly vulnerable the boys were and how resilient the girls were. It's not that the girls weren't damaged. Of course they were damaged. But where the boys, where it was the father, that was tragic. But where it was the mother, it was absolutely catastrophic for the boys. Yes. Can you explain why? Well, I, I've got a lot of theories on that. I think that, we, uh, I mean, certainly just natural um, um, gynocentric culture influences that. I think that the, uh, the idea that we sort of emotionally quarantine boys and force them to put all their emotional eggs in, in a one basket with women um, for their sense of worth and approval. Um, I know that uh, when I watched people go through divorces, which was really common in my work, I mean, divorce was as common as, as violence and, and other problems because alcohol and drugs destroys marriages at, at just incendiary rates, yeah. uh, is that the, the women were resilient and the men were absolutely flattened by divorce. Yes. yes. Um, uh, they were in terrible grief and their, their substance abuse, their alcohol consumption skyrocketed, uh, their sense of isolation and their risk of suicide went way up while the women circled their wagons and gave each other support. Even dysfunctional women that were alcoholic and, and drug dependent would have those social bonds and connections and where men tend to compete with each other 
they became weak. Uh, if they showed weakness, that, that separates men and even further isolates the guy going through the divorce. So he has nowhere to go. He has no, does not have his woman where he can have his emotional existence, and he really doesn't have male bonds that are strong enough to get him through that. And frequently, even during the process, at least during the process of divorce, men's own families will turn against them. Even regarding I've seen that. I've seen yes. that firsthand multiple times. And, and so part of it is on us. I think it is. We need to, to – I think the feminists were right about one thing. There are some things we need to change about the way we raise boys. But it's not about making them more like girls. Uh, it is about teaching them that their worth and their ability to, to survive is not dependent on a woman. And there's a very big difference between the way feminists want to approach how we help boys shape and form their, their sense of masculinity between them and us. Uh, they want to go with the original sin route, which is you're male, therefore you're flawed, therefore shut up and take it. And basically the same model for raising boys that we've always had. <clears throat> My answer is not that boys need to learn to sit around in, in circles with tissues and cry and watch Oprah, but that we do need to teach boys to connect to each other and to teach boys that, you know something, it's, they're not, that women aren't all sugar and spice, that they're flawed too, that they have problems and, the, and that they should have standards. I think, <gasps> you misogynist. Yes, I know. I, I think we should teach the boys the hateful dialogue that they should measure a woman's moral character before investing in her emotionally. Yeah, because one said to a man, you know how troubled she was. And, and then you went ahead, had a relationship with her. You got her pregnant and you have now handed your children over to a complete dangerous, violent woman. All yep. because you didn't act, you were so knocked up by the idea that every man would envy you because you looked so good on your arm. Arm candy, as far as I'm concerned, yep. is often the very worst thing that can happen to a man. A trophy wife is the one that will slide a knife in your back. And, That's right. And yeah. men, it's unfortunate. That's a fair criticism of the way we socialize men and of the way men are easily socialized because of their... Uh, I think just biology is that we, I was just in my twenties, I was absolutely mindless to the eye. What do you mean? What is her moral character? I hope it's bad. So she'll have sex quicker. Well, but you see, that is the other problem we have because time and time again, I've said to men and I, you can say the same of women because relationships with, but the, we're talking about men in this case I've said to men, look, if a really nice, decent woman came into your life, you wouldn't want her because you're so hooked on drama. And this is the thing that, that, that people get involved in the drama of the relationship. And they, for a while, it, it's the hardest thing to do when a woman comes in who's been in a mutually violent relationship, which let's face it is most relationships, is to get her to learn how to be peaceful because the drama keeps her on a high. And so you say to somebody, it's not, not your circus. Those are not your monkeys. And if you insist on going back to the circus, well, then you will actually end up like a sad old clown. And, it, and the, the mirror image of that is in telling men that if they are healthy, uh, if, they are, if they are not healthy, that that healthy woman, that the woman that's not going to cut their throat in their sleep and take their children and take their home, that if they are uh, not emotionally healthy as men, if they don't have a sense of self-worth, they're never mm -hmm. going to attract a woman like that. They're and, they, all, even, and even if they did, they wouldn't know what to do with her because they would be distrustful. Exactly. But uh, uh, I think that it's probably more common guys that are really white knights on shining, uh, with shining armor and spend their lives in submission and subservience and hide it behind masculine bravado, those guys don't attract healthy women. No, they, they don't. don't. They're not in, healthy women are not interested in being rescued, in being uh, uh, in, in, infantilized, or any of that stuff. 
which is ultimately what white knighting is. It's infantilizing women. Mm. Uh, and healthy women are turned off by that. Well, just like healthy women are actually turned off by radical feminism. Yes, they are. Very mm. much and, so. <laughs> and I, hopefully there's a whole new generation of much younger women who won't tolerate any of it because they've seen what a shocking <laughs> failure it's been. <laughs> All we got to do is give these young people permission to speak the truth and they'll start doing it. And that I believe is finally beginning to happen. We got a long way to go, but I tell you what, we've come a long way in five years. You've done brilliantly. I was going to ask you, we've got about five minutes left. If you had to have a conversation with your 13 year old self, what would you say now looking back? Would you have done anything differently? No. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I think I, I'm in, and I'm lucky. This is not bragging. This is really luck. Mm -hmm. But I think even more important for me to say before we close out that there mm -hmm. is a, a final chapter to that with my family, to my 13 year old self and to my 20 year old self and to my relationship with my mother and my father. Yeah. Uh, both of my parents have passed away mm -hmm. uh, where I look back. In, in that abusive family scene that uh, uh, really a lot of craziness and I didn't once it able to get into near all of it is that now I look back at my parents with such a profound sense of love mm. uh, uh, forgiveness yes forgiveness is critical to mm. healing forgiving yourself forgiving others not necessarily forgetting uh, you, because you want to take lessons and learn them. But the only true sense of healing, and, and it made me a much better, Dean asked about if, if that insight made me a better counselor. What really, I think, ultimately toward the end made me the best counselor I could be was looking back at my parents, at life, at all this stuff, and forgiving and finding a sense of peace within myself. Uh, and that is... I think the critical factor, because if you're locked in the anger of all this and, and there's, it's easy to feel anger about all this stuff that we deal with. I feel it. Uh, uh, every MRA feels it. Uh, everyone who's a real advocate for finding these kind of solutions feels this anger at this absolutely crazy system that wants nothing to do with it. But in your own personal life, uh, to have a place of being centered and balanced and remembering the, the really good things about my family and not denying the bad things, you've got to forgive. I think that's absolutely right, Paul. And on that note, thank you so much. And I hope that you are no longer nervous. <laughs> and well, <laughs> well, you're, you're, uh, I, I guess I got still, still more work to my, to do on myself because you're a woman you're a woman that absolutely scares the hell out of me. Um, but that's really a statement of respect more than anything else. I just, um, uh, I am continue to be in awe of your life. Eddie, oh. any, Aaron, you can get, Aaron has the ability to get people to talk about things that no one would ever think they'd be willing to talk about. That's why <laughs> I love her. So, um, so, all right, that was a great episode. Thank you for joining us, Paul. Thank you for sharing even more intimate things than you've ever shared before. Any closing thoughts for this week, Aaron? Well, yes, because I think with people listening to Paul will learn an enormous amount because it's only by, in a way, it's, I call it soul talk. It's when people are genuinely talking down to the wire about things that matter, that other people can have that awakening moment that Paul talks about. And that's the whole point of the program, is for help other people to wake up. Otherwise, how can they know? Excellent. I think you're absolutely right. And so this is going to go down as one of the best shows we've ever done. All right, everybody. See you next week on Tales from the Infrared. And we'll see you, I believe, after the new year. Uh, our next show will be on the 3rd. Uh, so... Everybody, have a great, wonderful Christmas. Have a happy new year. And James, if you could, take us home. You have been listening to When Did You Wake Up with Aaron Pitsy. We would like to thank James Huff, Paul Elam, and the A Voice for Men community for their support of this show. 
If you like what you hear and would like to continue to hear more, donations can be made on the front page of A Voice for Men. That's www.avoiceformen.com. Our theme music is Space 1990B by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. That's I-N-C-O-M-P-E-T-E-C-H.com. And is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution License 3.0. And will be noted in the show notes on YouTube. Thank you for listening.